Now let's discuss types of respiratory failures. So you have type 1 which is hypoxemic, type 2 is hypercapnic. So type 1 is decreased O2, type 2 is increased CO2, type 3 is due to anesthesia. Okay, it is perioperative respiratory failure due to lung atelectasis due to anesthesia, anesthesia atelectasis. And type 4 is due to shock, so hypoperfusion of the respiratory muscles. So again, uh, you have type 1 and type 2 mainly, hypoxemic, hypercapnic, okay. So type 1 is a diffusion defect, so PAO2, capital A is for alveoli, small a is for uh, artery, okay. So pulmonary uh, alveolar O2, it is around 100, pulmonary arterial O2, it is around 90. So difference is uh, around 10, so 5 to 15 mm of Hg is normal, okay. Type 1, there's a diffusion defect, okay. So you can have any fibrosis, okay, that doesn't allow the oxygen to go. You can have interstitial lung disease. Alveolar, instead of oxygen, you can have consolidation like in pneumonia or ARDS, okay, and pulmonary embolism. So oxygen cannot go into the blood, okay. So there is hypoxemia. So PAO2 is normal, okay, but P, uh, P, uh, alveolar is normal, P, uh, pulmonary uh, arterial is less, okay. So the gap, it increases because less oxygen is there here, the gap PA minus AO2 increases. PaCO2 is normal here, but PaCO2 is increased in type 2 because of hypoventilation, okay? There is a lot of carbon dioxide buildup because alveoli have carbon dioxide, blood also has carbon dioxide, okay? So what happens is PaO2 decreases in both, like alveoli and uh, pulmonary artery. So and because it is decreasing in both, there's no diffusion problem, right? So the gap is normal, okay? Only PSCO2 increases. So there is respiratory acidosis and type 2 respiratory failure. So what are the causes? You can remember it as COPD. You should not ventilate much, okay? So CO2 should not be washed out. So you can use narcotics. They cause respiratory depression. Any brainstem injury, okay? Any obstruction by foreign body or severe COPD, okay? Most common. And you can have peripheral neuromuscular disorders and D, diaphragmatic injury, okay? Next, treatment, so give oxygen, okay, and treat the underlying cause. If it is not improving, give me mechanical ventilation either by invasive mechanical ventilation, IMV, or non-invasive NIV, okay. So in IMV, you will give uh, positive pressure ventilation through an ET tube, so the airway is secured, so it is preferred in type 1. NIV is preferred in type 2 respiratory failure. It, a, a positive pressure ventilation is de uh, delivered through a face mask, but there are certain contraindications. So you don't want the patient to be unconscious or in altered sensorium, you don't want the patient to be uncooperative, okay, because he might aspirate the fluid. And also, uh, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, secure the airway first, okay. Again, if there's an active GI bleed or recent nasal surgery, don't give NIV. So again, in NIV, the advantages are decreased risk of pneumothorax because invasive, you, you might compress a bulla and cause pneumothorax. So here that is not there. And invasive, again, there is risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia as you might introduce uh, some bacteria. But here, the risk is less, okay? Then ARDS. It is characterized by acute respiratory distress syndrome. So acute. So acute shortness of breath, acute SOB. Again, uh, hypoxemia and bilateral diffuse lung infiltrates. This is important. If you look at the x-ray, you'll have bilateral diffuse lung infiltrates in ARDS. So again, what are the other names? It's also called non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, low pressure pulmonary edema, high permeability pulmonary edema, diffuse alveolar damage, so DAD, okay, and shock lung also because it occurs with septic shock. So what are the causes? See acute causes okay so you can have blood transfusion so trally burns pancreatic severe trauma okay sepsis severe pneumonia that can cause sepsis also again aspiration of gastric content so aspiration pneumonitis and toxin inhalation lung contusion near drowning also okay next uh, pathophysiology so in cardiogenic pulmonary edema what happens is you have left atrial pressure uh, becoming increased so in severe ms for example so again all of this pressure is transmitted and back into the right uh, ventricle and right atrium okay so that is why pulmonary capillary wedge pressure it is more than 18 mm of hg when you are measuring the pressure okay next uh, in non path in ARDS what happens is there is damage to capillary endothelium and alveolar epithelium at multiple sites so there is increased permeability to neutrophils okay there is inflammatory damage plus exudate so in ARDS uh, pulmonary capillary vest pressure is less okay less than 18 mm of Hg so ARDS uh, diagnostic criteria it is also called Berlin 2012 criteria so acute SOB non cardiogenic edema bilateral diffuse infiltrates on x-ray okay this is based on definition itself and finally pao2 by fio2 it is less than 300 mm of hg so based on that if it is less than 300 it is mild uh, less than 200 it is moderate ards less than 100 it is severe ards okay p by f okay 
next uh, trade the underlying cost so ultimately in ARDS you don't want to give lot of fluids okay give conservative fluid management because if you give too much fluid it might worsen the pulmonary edema fluid not only involves the liquid but also the air so give low volume low tidal volume mechanical ventilation okay again give uh, uh, low plateau pressure uh, so less than 30 centimeters of water okay to avoid ventilator associated lung injury okay so around 6 ml per kg tidal volume low tidal volume mechanical ventilation positive end expiratory pressure sedation to relax the patient to, to facilitate ventilation and also glucocorticoids may be beneficial then you also do ECMO so extracorporeal membrane oxygenation you take out the deoxy blood of the person and send it into a membrane oxygenator and then oxygenated blood is pumped back into the patient's body it is beneficial in severe ARDS in proning also what happens is when you stand some of the basal lungs they are compressed by the diaphragm the basal lung alveoli so when you are proning this effect is lost they also participate in oxygenation so again oxygenation increases it is beneficial in severe ARDS it is done consecutively for uh, 12 to 16 hours Moving on to management of hypoxia, see hypoxia is defined as lack of oxygen in the tissues. Hypoxemia is de decreased oxygen concentration of the blood, okay. So hypoxia is usually preceded by hypoxemia. So first, uh, hypoxia can be secondary to high altitude, it can be anemic, okay, and it can be secondary to left to right shunting, so cyanotic, all those things, stagnant or histotoxic. So hypoxic hypoxia, anemic hypoxia, stagnant hypoxia, and histotoxic hypoxia, okay. Histotoxic occurs because of cyanide poisoning. Stagnant, again, if the blood is not going. Uh, hypoxic hypoxia, if the person is not breathing in uh, oxygen. Uh, and uh, anemic hypoxia. So even if he is breathing in, if there are less RVCs or something like that, there is. So uh, clinical features, you'll have cyanosis, dyspnea, tachycardia, all of this. CNS, again, impaired judgment, drowsiness, inattentiveness, reduced work capacity. CVS, you'll have pulmonary vasoconstriction. So increase in pulmonary resistance and right ventricular afterload, okay? So increase in cardiac output, see, if O2 is decreases, uh, then CO2 increases, CO2 dilates your vessels, systemic vessels, okay? So there is increased cardiac output, generalized vasodilation. Metabolic effects, so lactic acidosis, metabolic acidosis, then blood, you can have secondary polycythemia. So pulse oximetry you can do, ABG you can do, chest x-ray to rule out any underlying lung disease. The treatment is by oxygen supplementation, okay, and treating the underlying cause. So oxygen therapy, see oxygen is widely available, it is a vital gas, it should be treated like any other drug, okay. So indications for oxygen therapy, so if there is any cardiac and respiratory arrest, okay, hypoxemia, hypotension, uh, respiratory distress, all those things, okay. See, low dose oxygen is given to patients with COPD. High dose, you will give it an asthma, pulmonary embolism, MI, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, hypotension, etc. Okay, so basically, uh, how to give oxygen? You can give by using oxygen masks. Okay, the mask and valve design allows de delivery from 24 to 90%, up to 90%, okay? So there are two types of oxygen masks. You have high flow and low flow masks. High flow masks, they contain venturi valves which work on Bernoulli's principle. Okay, so when oxygen passes through a narrow orifice, it produces a high velocity stream that draws a constant proportion of room air through the base of the venturi valve. Okay, so it is high flow. Okay, it can be accurately controlled to give inspired oxygen levels of up to 24 to 60%. Okay, next, uh, nasal prongs. So they are simple and convenient to use. They prevent rebreathing. So they are comfortable and allow talking and eating. Okay, again, high flow nasal oxygen. So it is a relatively new technique that is used in the ICU. So it is becoming uh, popular. It became popular because of COVID-19 patients. So uh, HFNO provides humidified titrated oxygen therapy. It matches or even exceeds the patient's inspiratory demand. Okay. It also limits the oxygen desaturation by prolonging apneic oxygenation. Next, uh, non-invasive ventilation. So supplemental oxygen, you can provide it by a full uh, face masks, uh, nasal uh, prongs and all that so invasive ventilation patient is in intubated and endotracheal tube is connected to a ventilator or oxygen source next uh, you can monitor the oxygen therapy based on abg and pulse ox findings so what are the complications so again uh, fire so facial burns and deaths of patients who smoke when using oxygen then again oxygen toxicity so it is irritant uh, it is an irritant it can cause uh, retinopathy of prematurity in the newborns okay and it can also damage the alveolar membrane for in when inhaled more than two days okay it can also cause ARDS Paul Burt effect so breathing hyperbaric oxygen can cause cerebral vasoconstriction and epileptic fits so that is called Paul Burt effect epilepsy in hyperbaric oxygen therapy next mechanical ventilation 
it is a method to mechanically assist or replace spontaneous breathing by using a mechanical ventilator okay so indications see when you have ARDS severe pneumonia respiratory failure COPD severe COPD okay acute severe asthma pulse circulatory failure uh, CNS failure so coma status epilepticus okay respiratory muscle paralysis all these conditions brainstem disorders so basically you have controlled mechanical ventilation so minute ventilation is completely dependent or it, it is controlled on the rate of uh, rate of tidal volume okay so if the patient makes any additional respiratory effort it does not contribute to minute ventilation next assist control so first cmv control mechanical ventilation then assist control so patient can increase the minute ventilation by triggering additional breaths okay so it, uh, the minute ventilation is determined not just by tidal volume but also based on respiratory rate next intermittent mandatory ventilation so cmv is over now imv so it is similar to assisted uh, control in that min uh, minimal minute ventilation is dependent on respiratory rate and the tidal volume but here in additional initiated breaths are not supported by the ventilator but in synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation so simv patient can breathe on his own in addition to the set number of breaths delivered by the ventilator in cpap you only provide pressure support okay uh, then weaning so you should not take the patient suddenly off of the ventilator support you do it over a period of hours to days this is because uh, mechanical ventilation when the patient is adapted and may not be able to breathe when you suddenly take him off next so complications so there can be migration of the tip of the endotracheal tube into a main bronchus this can cause uh, atelectasis okay then uh, barotrauma can occur if you give high volume and high pressures okay so you'll have subcutaneous emphysema pneumothorax pneumomediastinum things like that and also hypotension can occur respiratory alkalosis can occur because of hyperventilation okay increased uh, co2 wash out tracheal stenosis can occur if endotracheal tube is kept for a long time and ventilator associated pneumonia now let's discuss ild and pneumoconiosis so ilds are also known as diffuse lung diseases they are a heterogeneous group of disorders characterized by diffuse lung involvement so parenchyma includes the alveoli the epithelium and especially the interstitium okay so interstitial lung diseases they produce a restrictive ventilatory defect, uh, defect so there is restrictive defect so restricting the inflow so there is no airway obstruction there is hypoxemia obviously okay so two histopathological patterns are uh, recognized so they include those with fibrosis and those with predominant granulomatous reaction okay so basically uh, if you look at the radiological patterns of interstitial lung disease so again so first you'll have uh, sob plus dry cough because of the fibrosis and fine crepts as well okay so first you'll have reticular pattern on chest x-ray in ct you can have ground glass opacities or increased consolidation then because of fibrosis the bronch uh, the bronchioles are pulled okay they're pulled together and they dilate okay that that is traction bronchiectasis and in advanced ild you will see something called honeycombing okay so you have many radial uh, pathological patterns of ild so basically you have uip so usual interstitial pneumonia it is the most common pattern overall okay and if it is of unknown etiology you call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis okay then uip nsip is non-specific it is most commonly seen in uh, connective tissue disorders except rheumatoid arthritis ra you will see uh, uip okay then you can have aip acute interstitial pneumonia you can have uh, dip desquamative interstitial pneumonia you can have lip lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia you can have cryptogenic organizing pneumonia so cop and res respiratory bronchiolitis ild so uip you'll have minimal ground glass opacities but significant traction bronchiectasis in nsip non-specific you'll have significant ground glass opacities okay so both uh, bilateral lower zone involvement is seen in uip you'll have plenty of fibroblastic foci okay so that is why you will find significant traction bronchiectasis but minimal ground glass opacities and also you'll see honeycombing see honeycombing you'll see in uip nsip you'll see ground glass opacities okay and less uh, fibroblastic foci you'll see lymphocytes mainly okay and again in both you will see fine grips uh, clubbing also you can see so that is important so basically uh, clinical features you will have chronic dyspnea dry cough wheezing and chest pain rarely okay you can have history of occupational exposure you can have clubbing and sinuses and tachypnea you can ha you can have bilateral fine end in respiratory crypts okay fine crypts okay so again what are the causes of ild you can have all the pneumoconiosis you can have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis okay if you don't know the reason then sarcoidosis and all the connective tissue disorders so sle jogren ra seismic sclerosis pulmonary vas uh, vasculitis and hypersensitive pneumonitis like farmer's lung you can have viral pneumonias interstitial pneumonias and you can have following ards pneumocystis pneumonia miliary tuberculosis drugs like amiodarone and gold okay 
so investigations you can see reticulations on x-ray okay you can see honeycombing as well okay and sarcoidosis and uh, underlying disease features you can see like sarcoidosis you can see bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy eggshell calcification and silicosis okay so ct scan you can see reticulonodular pattern ground glass opacity extraction bronchiectasis honeycombing all that okay and uh, lung biopsy it is a most definitive method for doing an ild and biopsy should be done before starting the treatment okay so um, again pulmonary function tests also restrictive pattern they will show you and uh, arterial blood gas analysis they reveal hypoxemia and respiratory alkalosis because of hyperventilation okay then other investigations you can measure the antibody levels as well treatment again gives steroids they are the mainstay of therapy so prednisolone 0.5 to 1 mg per kg uh, once a day so you do it for 3 months or 1 to 3 months and then again assess so then you taper the dose so farmer's lung it is a type of hypersensitivity pneumonitis induced by uh, inhale inhaling the biological dust from the hay or mold spores or any other agricultural products so growth of mold spores occurs when the hay is not dried properly so when there is damping like uh, late winter early spring okay it is seen after the harvest season in the damp climates so when farmer inhales some mold spores and other particles it induces an allergic reaction in the alveoli this causes accumulation of fluid protein inflammatory cells in the alveoli impairs the gas exchange and compromises lung function chronic exposure leads to fibrosis and thus all this thing so again this is caused by thermophilic actinomycetes okay uh next clinical features so again acute stage this occurs 4 to 8 hours after the exposure you can have headache cough shortness of breath subacute after repeated exposure okay chronic they persist for a long time again it is often difficult to diagnose but again history of symptoms occupational exposure all that it will help in diagnosis okay then investigation stress x ray blood tests uh, all this spirometry so prevention so again proper drying of the products uh, using uh, good ventilation uh, uh provision of good ventilation use of a mask okay then pneumoconiosis this refers to a group of lung diseases caused by inhalation of inorganic dust okay after inhaling these inorganic dust particles they get deposited in the alveoli they cause inflammation and fibrosis okay so the principal cause is workplace exposure or environmental exposure is rare but workplace exposure so it takes many years to develop although in some cases like silicosis rapid forms can occur even after short period of exposure okay when severe they cause lung impairment disability and premature death okay so other forms of pneumoconiosis can be caused by inhaling dusts which contain aluminum antimony all these things so common causes silicosis asbestosis coal workers pneumoconiosis berylliosis cirrhosis by iron oxide stenosis by tin oxide so moving on to silicosis so silica uh, silicosis is the most common occupational lung disease you inhale the crystalline silica so quartz so less commonly inhalation of silicates crystalline and silicates okay and silicon dioxide bound to talc so especially in rock and sand miners glass makers sand blasters in these factories you can find so uh, after inhalation the silica particles are deposited in the distal airways so if you look at this see here in uh, in silicosis what happens is you are inhaling the silica particles especially in the upper nodes so uh, you will have pale to black nodules okay so mostly pale and hilar nodes are enlarged there is axial calcification so microscopically you'll have a silica crystal amorphous center okay polarized microscope you can see them and surrounding that you can have fibrosis uh, okay concentrically arranged uh, collagen fibers so oral appearance advanced stage you can have progressive massive fibrosis okay so basically that is what happens so you'll inhale the silica that will cause inflammation macrophages release of cytokines il160 nf alpha okay so all of this causes fibrosis so there uh, Uh, again when the macrophages die they release the silica into the interstitium then the silicotic nodule is formed which is pathognomonic so acute silicosis again rapid onset of symptoms so cough weight loss fatigue pleuritic pain lung crypts okay chronic silicosis again you can have uh, chronic dyspnea cough and sputum see in all ilds you can have right heart failure signs so raised jvp hepatomegaly peripheral edema right ventricular heave okay in all ilds you can write this commonly in chronic conditions okay so severe lung disease then you can have complicated uh, silicosis as well so silicosis is mostly as, uh, associated with tuberculosis so it is called silico tuberculosis combined entity so chest x ray you can see round opacity is predominantly in the upper lobes hilar lymph nodes you can see, uh, see egg shell calcification h uh, ct uh, hrct chest you can pick the nodules silicotic nodules fibrosis all that then pulmonary function test again restrictive changes lung biopsy you can find it tuberculin skin test also 
treatment no no treatment specifically just avoid it and the bronchodilators to relieve the obstruction and uh, corticosteroid therapy and lung transplant in severe cases if indicated next coal workers pneumoconiosis so it is a parenchymal lung disease you inhale a lot of coal mine dust so you have bituminous coal and anthra uh, anthracite coal so anthracosis is asymptomatic accumulation without any cellular reaction so it occurs in tobacco inhalers so inhale, inhaled coal dust becomes a problem when the body reacts to it with subs uh, subsequent fibrosis okay so again it is black lung so cwp is also called simple pneumoconiosis if uh, the radiographic opacities are less than one centimeter in diameter but if any opacity is more than one centimeter uh, on chest x-ray so then it is progressive microfibrosis so terminology changes next inhaled uh, coal dust again it goes into the lung causes inflammatory reaction it activates the macrophages they inhale the co uh, they ingest the coal okay you can see coal laden macrophages okay here you can see in uh, coal locus pneumoconiosis again in the upper parts of the lung you can have black macules or nodules over time they become black pigmented scars grossly microscopically pulmonary anthracosis alveoli interstitial macrophages with uh, ingested carbon pigment okay then uh, simple coal workers pneumoconiosis the alveoli with uh, coal surrounded by uh, collagen small network of collagen progressive massive fibrosis it is complicated there's a dense collagenous uh, scar with coal pigment okay so again you can see all the same thing here so clinical manifestation so cough and black sputum production in other uh, pneumoconiosis you'll have dry cough okay but here cough with black sputum dyspnea will be common again severe lung disease all these same and uh, chest x-ray again small nodules in the upper lung zones again treatment is same as that of silicosis um, moving on to beryllium disease again beryllium you use it in industries because of its lightweight and high tensile strength electronics telecommunications aircraft making automotive making so transport make uh, vehicle making okay so pathogens uh, it elicits inflammation and chemical pneumonitis in the acute form in chronic form it acts as an antigen elicits delayed type 4 hypersensitivity and causes non caseating granulomas and it is hence uh, similar to sarcoidosis okay and it's also transported to extra pulmonary sites like liver skin, uh, spleen skin and lymph nodes where granulomas non caseating granulomas are formed so clinical features you can have pharyngitis tracheobronchitis chemical pneumonitis okay from up top to bottom pharynx uh, trachea and bronchi and then uh, lung okay uh, chronic beryllium disease resembles sarcoidosis formation of granulomas okay so you'll have dyspnea dry cough weight loss fatigue all are common in all pneumoconiosis dyspnea dry cough fatigue and weight loss sometimes chest pain okay here you can see lymphadenopathy hepatosplenomegaly and skin rash because they are going to extra pulmonary sites as well the beryllium particles so again you can see nodular opacities while writing a be beryllium you'll write it like nodules right so reticular nodular opacities and hilar adenopathy one important test is beryllium specific lymphocyte transformation test it differentiates from sarcoidosis it demonstrates the proliferation of lymphocytes from blood or lungs in response to beryllium salts in vitro so in a test tube take blood add uh, beryllium and if there is proliferation of lymphocytes so that a uh, test is positive okay again avoidance is the treatment then moving on to asbestosis it refers to the pneumoconiosis caused by inhalation of asbestos fibers okay so you have chrysolite and amphibole and also crocodolite so there are the three types of asbestos fibers that cause disease so again uh, epidemiology people working in asbestos mines roofing insulation factories all of them okay so basically uh, risk of asbestosis increases with cumulative exposure and manifestations appear after 20 years okay so macrophages again you'll inhale them macrophages are attracted there is fibrosis initially fibrosis is in the smaller airways then later whole lung there is honeycombing okay asbestos bodies are visible under microscopy so especially diffuse fibrosis it affects the lower lobes and subplural region in asbestosis you can see plural plaques also so asbestos bodies are golden brown fusiform or dumbbell shaped so you can have diffuse interstitial fibrosis visceral fibrosis especially of the pleura so plural plaques and honeycomb fibrosis and you can have distorted enlarged air spaces okay so again uh, clinical manifestations again dry cough dyspnea cyanosis clubbing weight loss fatigue fine crepitations and severe disease uh, severe disease again right heart failure signs jays jvp hep hepatomegaly peripheral edema right ventricular heat so again chest x-ray you can see those signs pyrometry again hrct lung biopsy 
and treatment no specific treatment give oxygen if there is hypoxemia lung transplant and finally uh, bisnosis it is a reactive airway disease so because of cotton dust you will have bronchoconstriction so again uh, mon monday morning uh, symptoms are there so patient presents with asthma like symptoms on the first day of work monday after a weekend which diminishes again by the weekend so diagnosis is made by uh, again clinical history expo history of exposure to raw cotton so avoid those conditions moving on to tropical pulmonary eosinophilia it is a distinct syndrome that develops in some individuals with lymphatic filariasis so basically what happens is males are most commonly affected young males that too so ukrytia bankrafti and brugia malai uh, are the main causes so when the microfilaria are trapped in the lungs there is an exaggerated immune response okay so eosinophilia so patients are usually from filaria endemic areas they usually present with nocturnal dry cough and wheezing because of nocturnal periodicity of the microfilaria so nocturnal dry cough nocturnal wheeze so low grade fever because it is an infection and high blood eosinophil counts based on the name itself usually greater than 3000 eosinophils per microliter okay so clinical symptoms are due to allergic and inflammatory reactions so in interstitial fibrosis and lung damage can happen so eosinophil count is high chest x-ray you can see diffuse miliary mottling so diffuse miliary lesions or mottled opacities pulmonary function test both restrictive and obstructive serum ig is elevated antifilarial antibodies are elevated so differential diagnosis is Loeffler syndrome, Chirk's stress, you can have uh, allergic granulomatosis with anitis. Then uh, vaginous granulomatosis, CEP, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, asthma, ABPA, uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, all that. So again, uh, so treatment, give DEC. It should be given at a dosage of 4 to 6 mg per kg or 2 to 3 doses per day for 3 weeks. Okay, so 3 2s are 6 mg per kg body weight. 3 doses per day, 3 weeks, okay? So DEC plus alvandazole is more effective. So again, uh, it is a hypersensitivity reaction to microfilaria of both uh, Ukraria and Drugia. So again, uh, all these conditions are satisfied. So again, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it is type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity. Serum IgE is normal, there is no peripheral eosinophilia. So you'll have non-cachiating granulomas. So you'll have farmer's lung uh, because of micropolysporaphenia. Bagasosis because of thermoactinomyces saccharii, malt worker's lung because of aspergillus clavitus, bird fancier's lung, and hot tub lung. Next, okay, so uh, diagnostic criteria. There is an exposure to the antigen, occurrence within uh, 4 hours, okay, recurrence on re exposure. You'll have fine reps and weight loss as with other restrictive diseases, and pre uh, presence of serum uh, precipitins against the offending antigen. So, avoidance therapy is main and steroids. So allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis again allergies ige is elevated there's a history of asthma and cystic fibrosis so uh, eosinophilia eosinophils ige elevation and skin test is positive for aspergillus fumigatus okay so chest you will see upper zone opacities on chest x-ray and bronchiectasis again so steroids you'll give and itraconazole antifungal next invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in immunocompromised people you'll have fungal pneumonia so basically shortness of breath hemoptysis fever all that so basically this is a normal black lung shadow white filaments you can see fungal filaments and around that you can see blood okay so it is less white it is called ct halo sign then you can have air crescent sign also so basically uh, during recovery within the fungal filaments again alveoli start opening up so that causes air crescent sign so treatment again is with voriconazole aspergilloma or fungal ball there is colonization in a pre-existing cavity so you'll see something called crescent sign or monad sign okay so ball is changing its position with the patient's decubitus treatment is very resection sarcoidosis so it's a multi-system disorder with non-caseating granulomas so etiology is autoimmune so mycobacterium tuberculosis some people say it acts as an antigen and causes granulomatous inflammation but mechanism is unclear so basically most commonly pulmonary involvement is seen so scadding staging is there so first you have bilateral uh, hilar lymphadenopathy then along with bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy you will have lung infiltrates then three only lung infiltrates and four fibrosis okay so most common presentation is with respiratory symptoms so cough and shortness of breath so phenotypes again skin involvement can be there so lupus perneo so here you have the eyes you have the nose so bridge of the nose is involved and the area between the eyes and the cheeks okay so lupus perneo nodules are there lofgren syndrome so you can see erythema nodosum and uh, arthritis hilar lymphadenopathy again uveitis all that uveoparotid fever or hereford syndrome so i like to call it as uveoparotid facial fever so uh, uvo uveitis anterior uveitis parotid so parotiditis and fever and uh, facial so facial nerve palsy 
so cbcc there is peripheral lymphocyte opinion because of sequestration of lymphocytes into the lungs in the granulomas in the lungs you'll have lymphocytes so all the lymphocytes are going into the lungs so peripheral lymphocyte opinion uh, in the blood okay but you can have uh, pancytopenia as well if because it's an infiltrative disorder if it infiltrates the bone marrow if it infiltrates the spleen you can have hypersplenism and thrombocytopenia like that okay next granulomas they can secrete ace okay angiotensin converting and then so serum ace levels will increase and again they also increase the level of vitamin d that causes hypercalcemia ctgs you can see pulmonary and mediastinal lymph node env uh, involvement so again in tb lymph nodes there is central necrosis k-shaded necrosis so central hypodensity with peripheral rim enhancement sarcoid lymph nodes there is uniform density okay then bronchoscopy ball you can see lymphocytosis okay and uh, non gaseating granulomas on biopsy investigation of choice so biopsy of the organ you will see non gaseating granulomas gallium scan you can see panda sign because of involvement of eyes and parotid and also mediastinum mediastinum you can see lambda sign because of involvement of mediastinal lymph nodes treatment so asymptomatic patients you just wait and watch and symptomatic patients you give steroids and then methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine so looking at the textbook so it's a chronic systemic disease again uh, unknown etiology non gaseating granulomas lungs and lymphatics are more affected so uh, it can vary from asymptomatic to multi organ failure so mostly white people are affected northern europe north america uh, japan etc women are more affected so there seems to be an exaggerated cellular response so then exogenous agent induces immunological sensitization by acting as a hapten it binds to peptides or alters the mhc molecules major histocompatibility complex so you have mycobacterium tuberculosis atypical mycobacteria viruses pollen etc beryllium also uh, it is identical to sarcoidosis so some people have found evidence of mycobacterial dna in sarcoid tissue okay and uh, pathogens is the unknown antigen it triggers a cell mediated immune response there is cd4 t lymphocyte accumulation and mononuclear macrophages so granulomas are formed non gaseating granulomas organ dysfunction results from granulomas distorting the architecture of the infected tissue so there is fibrosis and permanent damage so hypercalcemia as we said and because of this you can have nephrolithiasis nephrocalcinosis which can lead to ckd again respiratory system you have cough shortness of breath so upper lobes are more affected pleura can also be affected there is irreversible fibrosis and honeycombing as well hematologically you can have lipocytopenia anemia pancytopenia again splenic sequestration so thrombocytopenia then cvs you can have conduction defects if it infiltrates into the heart you'll have arrhythmia arrhythmia so nervous system you'll have facial nerve palsy so again we talked about here for syndrome along with that you can have seizures meningitis cortical involvement if it in infiltrates into the cortex and meninges and uh, peripheral neuropathy hepatosplenomegaly is common Par uh, parotid involvement okay pancreas next skin you can have erythema nodosum papules plaques nodules lupus pernio again we said so i you can have uh, here for syndrome so anterior or posterior uveitis so musculoskeletal system you can have effusion into the joints myalgia and arthralgia if it infiltrates the joints and the uh, muscles and endocrine you can have diabetes insipidus diabetes mellitus hypopituitarism and hypothyroidism if it infiltrates the th uh, thyroid and the pituitary okay next investigation so ace levels are uh, elevated vitamin d levels are elevated hypercalcemia non gaseating fibr uh, granulomas you can have quimes test okay so uh, if you intradermally inject a validated antigen and if you find granulomas it is there uh, it is positive okay quimes test for sarcoidosis then chest x ray shows hilar lymphadenopathy and you can see uh, interstitial alveolar and nodular pattern opacities hrct is uh, better for this and gallium scan panda sign and lambda sign uh, so treatment again you can give corticosteroids so prednisolone is started at a dose of 0.5 to 1 mg per kg per day continued over several weeks and tapered over one month uh, sorry one year next uh, hydroxychloroquine is used for serious and disfiguring cutaneous sarcoidosis so hcq tnf alpha receptor antagonists like infliximab also have shown benefit moving on to lung abscess and empyema lung abscess is defined as necrosis of the pulmonary tissue and formation of a cavity after the necrosis contain it contains a necrotic debris or fluid caused by the infection so it is usually single and measures greater than 2 cm diameter formation of multiple small abscesses is occasional occasionally referred as necrotizing pneumonia so it can be acute or chronic single or multiple so most frequently it is caused by bacteria that to anaerobes so peptostreptococcus and a few sub bacterium prevotella etc anaerobic pathogens okay so roots of infection they include aspiration of oral secretions oral anaerobes endobronchial obstruction and causing bronchiectasis and infection and stasis of contents and all that and hematogenous seeding of the lung okay so lung abscess can also occur due to secondary infection of a pre-existing cavity cyst or bulla 
and uh, see aspiration of or uh, oral secretions is the most common way so it occurs in patients with altered consciousness uh, anesthesia alcoholics sedative drugs etc so poor oral hygiene dental caries are risk factors bronchial obstruction it causes bronchiectasis and the secondary infection and abscess formation is there then immunodeficiency is a risk factor then uh, hematogenous seeding can occur uh, in sepsis or uh, other conditions like that okay so you'll have typically multiple lung abscesses aerobic pathogens streptococci staphylococci other uh, organisms you can have klebsiella pseudomonas especially in uh, immunocompromised people burkholdt area etc okay so by definition it is more than 2 cm in diameter it is filled with purulent secretions so posterior segment of right upper lobe so rul p okay uh, right upper lobe and apical segments of lo both lower lobes okay are affected commonly after aspiration uh, because of hematogenous seeding if it is there then any lobe may be infected so you'll have high grade fever infections so chills and rigors cough with purulent sputum okay dyspnea and chest pain hemoptysis may be present so you'll see clubbing okay and then uh, amphoric or cavernous bronchial breath sounds over the cavity okay and crepitations may be heard pleural rub may be there so blood you'll see pmnls uh, so neutrophilia infection okay so x-ray chest you'll see an abscess cavity with a fluid level so ct scan may be uh, need, uh, needed to differentiate it from a loculated empyema so smear and culture of sputum bronchoscopy again so complications it can be, uh, see it can spread so brain abscess or purulent meningitis it can spread to the brain metastatic infection or secondary amyloidosis in chronic cases or it can develop a bronchopleural fistula it can give rise to empyema these three are the same complications of empyema as well you can also have pericarditis and hemoptysis so treatment intravenous uh, amoxiclav okay can be used as initial therapy then uh, if aspiration is suspected you also can give penicillin okay so again like amoxicillin plus metronidazole okay next uh, lung abscess it develops in hospitals so it is caused by klebsiella pseudomonas staph aureus etc you have to give third generation cephalosporins aminoglycoside and metronidazole okay so antibiotic therapy should be continued until radiographic resolution uh, happens so usually six to eight weeks of therapy is needed so physiotherapy is also required empyema is collection of pus in the pleural space so it develops when uh, pyogenic bacteria fungi uh, mycobacteria etc they, inv they invade the pleural space either from pneumonia or from direct inoculation like chest injury or something so trauma you can have penetrating chest injuries infections and so pneumonia tuberculosis bronchiectasis lung abscess all these conditions iatrogenic so thoracic surgery and following pleural aspiration okay again spread from other sites like rupture of a subphenic abscess and liver abscess clinical features again fever ch uh, fever with chills and rigors so uh, chest pain dyspnea okay again you can have cough with purulent sputum and bronchopleural fistula then you will uh, see if you auscultate you will have pus all over right so you will have decreased breath sounds you will have uh, uh, and again when you percuss you will have dull node okay you will have clubbing as well absent breath sounds tenderness and bulging of intercostal spaces because of the pus accumulation on the side of the empyema then rarely it can penetrate the pleura and collect in the subcutaneous tissue it forms a empyema necessitans it increases on coughing so uh, there is a cough impulse next uh, patient may be toxic with signs of uh, sepsis next uh, empyema should be suspected in any case of pneumonia with pleural effusion okay pneumonia with pleural effusion always suspect empyema then chest x-ray again it is the same as that of pleural effusion but loculations may be there if you do ultrasound you can see fibrin strands so that, uh, that suggests empyema then again aspirate the pleural fluid and uh, you know do pleural fluid analysis so gram stain afb stain all that okay and then ph because of bacteria and metabolism it will be acidic and all that uh, next complications again blanco pleural fistula chronic uh, conditions you'll have amyloidosis metastatic infection deformities of the thoracic cage so again antibodies are given on culture sensitivity results okay pending the results you can give uh, gram positive and gram negative cover so uh, penicillin aminoglycosides and metronidazole for anaerobes so six weeks treatment empyema due to tuberculosis you will give att okay and uh, empyema should be drained either by closed or open methods closed drainage is by needle aspiration or ice, uh, intercostal tube and uh, uh, open drainage is by thoracotomy and it is required if there is a fistula blancopleural fistula or multiple loculations or if the fluid is too thick so clubbing is defined as enlargement of soft tissues in the terminal phalanges leading to both transverse and longitudinal curving of uh, nails so you have a lobby bond angle which is normally less than 160 degrees but in clubbing it is greater than 180 degrees okay so causes so you have respiratory cvs gat causes endocrine causes and all that so first uh, respiratory causes you have infections okay tuberculosis lung abscess empyema okay 
then bronchiectasis also it can cause a lung abscess so again so bronchiectasis and tumors so mesothelioma and bronchogenic carcinoma and interstitial lung disease and cystic fibrosis then cvs again infections you have infective endocarditis and uh, see basically the mechanism of clubbing is chronic hypoxia leads to opening of av fistulas which increase the blood supply to the digits and toes leading to soft tissue hypertrophy so chronic hypoxia and cyanotic congenital heart diseases infections again infective endocarditis so gat inflammatory bowel disease so you have ulcerative colitis crohn's okay and again cancer so hcc endocrine you have acromegaly causing growth here okay and also myxedema so miscellaneous you can have unilateral clubbing so hypoxia on one side so it can be caused by a pancreas tumor compressing the vessels or subclavian artery aneurysm okay unit digital clubbing you can have it in trauma so grade one is softening of the nail bed you'll see fluctuation then grade two loss of lower bond angle so shamrath sign you can uh, put both fingers like this and check Next, uh, grade 3 is parrot beak appearance and, or drumstick appearance and grade 4 is uh, swelling of fingers in all dimensions associated with hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. So please also go through pulmonary function test, cystic fibrosis, infections like pneumonia, tuberculosis, whooping cough, so body telepathosis, then COVID-19 and bronchogenic carcinoma and the paraneoplastic syndromes associated with it to complete respiratory system.